Good morning, fourth grade, and welcome to our very last day of holes. I hope you guys have enjoyed this book. This is one of my favorite books when I was a kid. Um, there's also a movie. I definitely think that you should go watch it. It's also a fantastic movie, and it's very, very, very much right off of the book. It's so close. It's awesome. Uh, you can watch the movie on Disney Plus if you have it, or if you have Amazon Prime, or you can rent it on YouTube. It does cost money to rent it on YouTube, but it's a really good movie, so it might be worth doing. So talk to your parents. If you have Disney Plus, I would definitely give it a uh, watch. So let's get started with our very last day of holes, you guys. Chapter 49. There never used to be yellow spotted lizards in the town of Green Lake. They didn't come to the area until after the lake dried up. The townsfolk had heard about the red-eyed monsters living in the desert hills. One afternoon, Sam the Onion Man and his donkey, Mary Lou, were returning to his boat, which had anchored just a little offshore. It was late in November and the peach trees had almost had lost most of their leaves. Sam, someone called. He turned around to see three men running after him, waving their hats. He waited. Afternoon, Walter, Bo, Jesse. He greeted them as they walked up, catching their breath. Glad we caught you, said Bo. We're going to rattles we're going rattlesnake hunting this morning. We want to get some of your lizard juice, said Walter. I ain't scared of no rattlesnakes, said Jesse, but I don't want to come across one of those red eyed monsters. I seen one once, and that was enough. I knew about the red eyes, of course. I hadn't heard about the big black teeth. It's the white tongues that get me, said Bo. Sam gave each man two bottles of pure onion juice. He told them to drink one bottle before going to bed that night, then a half bottle in the morning, and then a half bottle around lunchtime. You sure this stuff works? asked Walter. I'll tell you what, said Sam. If it doesn't, you can come back next week and I'll give you your money back. Walter looked unsure, and Bo and Jesse laughed. Then Sam laughed too. Even Mary Lou let out a rare hee-haw. Just remember, Sam told the men before they left, it's very important that you drink a bottle tonight. You got to get it into your bloodstreams. The lizards don't like onion blood. So, just, just so you remember, that's why the lizard didn't bite Stanley. Stanley and Zero sat in the back seat of Mr. Morango's BMW. His suitcase lay between them. It was locked, and they decided they'd let Stanley's father open it to try to open it in his workshop. You don't know what's in it, do you? She asked. No, said Stanley. I didn't think so. The air conditioning was on, but they drove with the windows open as well because, no offense, but you boys smell really bad. Miss Morango explained that she was a patent attorney. I'm helping your father with a new product he's invented. He's happened to mention your situation, so I did a little investigating. Clyde Livings and sneakers were stolen sometime before 3.15. I found a young man, Derek Doom, who said that at 3.20, you were in the bathroom fishing your notebook out of the toilet. Two girls remembered seeing you come out of the boys' restroom carrying a wet notebook. Stanley felt his ears redden. Even after everything he'd been through, the memories still caused him to feel shame. You, you, so you couldn't have stolen them, said Miss Rango. He didn't. I did, said Zero. You did what? asked Miss Morango. I stole the sneakers. The lawyer actually turned around while driving and looked at him. I didn't hear that, she said, and I advise you to make sure I don't hear it again. What did my father invent? Stanley asked. Did he find a way to recycle shoes? No, he's still working on that, said Miss Morango, but he invented a product that eliminates foot odor. Here, I've got a sample in my briefcase. I wish I had more. You two could bathe in it. She opened her briefcase with one hand and passed a small bottle back to Stanley. It had a fresh and somewhat spicy, sp spicy smell. He handed it to Zero. What's it called? Stanley asked. We haven't come up with a name yet, said Miss Morango. It smells familiar, said Zero. Peaches, right? said Miss Morango. That's what everyone says. A short while later, both boys fell asleep. Behind them, the sky had turned dark, and for the first time in over a hundred years, a drop of rain fell into the empty lake. Part 3 filling in the holes. Stanley's mother insists that there was never a curse. She even doubts whether Stanley's great-great-grandfather really stole a pig. The reader might find it interesting, however, that Stanley's father invented his cure for foot odor the day after the great-great-grandson of Elia Nats carried the great-great-grandson of Madame Zeroni up the mountain. Which means that the curse, which is from Madame Zeroni, Zero is actually his great-great-grandson, so when Stanley carried him out up the mountain, that promise was finally fulfilled. The Attorney General closed up Camp Green Lake. Miss Walker, who was in desperate need of money, had to sell the land which had been in her family for generations. It was bought by a national organization dedicated to the well-being of young girls. In a few years, Camp Green Lake will become a Girl Scout camp. 
This is pretty much the end of the story. The reader probably has some questions still, but unfortunately, from here on in, the answers tend to be long and tedious. While Mrs. Bell, Stanley's former math teacher, might want to know the percent change in Stanley's weight, the reader probably cares more about the change in Stanley's character and self-confidence. But those changes are subtle and hard to measure. There is no simple answer. Even the contents of the suitcase turned out to be somewhat tedious. Stanley's father pried it open in his workshop, and at first, everyone gasped at the sparkling jewels. Stanley thought he and Hector had become millionaires, but the jewels were of very poor quality, worth no more than $20,000. Underneath the jewels had, was a stack of, a pa of papers that once had belonged to the first Stanley Elnats. These consisted of stock certificates, deeds of trust, and promissory notes. They were hard to read and even more difficult to understand. Miss Marengo's long firm spent more than two months going through all the papers. They turned out to be a lot more valuable than the jewels. After legal fees and taxes, Stanley and Zero each received less than a zero dollars, less than a million dollars but not a lot less. It was enough for Stanley to buy his family a new house with a laboratory in the basement and for Hector to hire a team of private investigators. But it would be boring to go through all the tedious details of all the changes in their lives. Instead, the reader will be presented with one last scene, which took place almost a year and a half after Stanley and Hector left Green, Camp Green Lake. You'll have to fill in the holes yourself. There was a small party, party at the Yelnats house. Except for Stanley and Hector, everyone there was an adult. All kinds of snacks and drinks were set out on the counter, including caviar, champagne, and the fixings to make ice cream sundaes. The Super Bowl was on TV, but nobody was really watching. It should be coming out of the next break, Miss Marengo announced. A timeout was called in the football game and a commercial came on screen. Everyone stopped talking and watched. The commercial showed a baseball game. Amid a cloud of dust, Clyde Livingston slid into home plate as the catcher caught the ball and tried to tag him out. Safe, shouted the umpire as he signaled with his arms. The people at Stanley's house cheered as if the run really counted. Clyde Livingston got up and dusted the dirt off of his uniform. As he made his way back to the dugout, he spoke, off the he spoke to the camera. Hi, I'm Clyde Livingston, and everyone around here calls me Sweet Feet. Way to go, Sweet Feet, said another baseball player, slapping his hand. Besides being on television screen, Clyde Livingston was also sitting on a couch next to Stanley. My feet are always sweet the television Clyde Livingston said as he sat down on the dugout bench. They used to smell so bad that nobody would sit next to me in the dugout. They really did stink, said the woman sitting in the couch on the other side of Clyde. She held her nose with one hand and fanned the air with the other. Clyde shushed her. Then a teammate told me about sploosh, said the television. He pulled out a can of sploosh from out under the dugout bench and held it up for everyone to see. I just spray a little on each foot each morning and now I have, I really do have sweet feet. Plus, I like the tingle. Sploosh, said a voice. A treat for your feet, made from all natural ingredients. It neutralizes odor, causing fungi and bacteria. Plus, you'll like the tingle. Everyone at the party clapped their hands. He wasn't lying, said the woman who sat next to Clyde. I couldn't even be in the same room with his socks. The other people at the party laughed. The woman continued. I'm not joking. It was so bad. You've made your point, said Clyde, covering her mouth with his hand. He looked back at Stanley. Will you do me a favor, Stanley? Stanley raised and lowered his left shoulder. I'm going to get more caviar, said Clyde. Keep your hand over my wife's mouth. He patted Stanley on the shoulder as he rose from the couch. Stanley looked uncertainly at his hand and then at Clyde Livingston's wife. She winked at him. He felt himself blush and turned away under, toward Hector, who was sitting on the floor in front of an overstuffed chair. A woman sitting in the chair behind Hector was absentmindedly fluffing his hair with her fingers. She wasn't very old, but her skin had a weathered look to it, almost like leather. Her eyes seemed weary, and if she, as if she had seen too many things in her life that she didn't want to see. And when she smiled, her mouth seemed too big for her face. Very softly, she half singed, half hummed a song that her grandmother used to sing to her when she was a little girl. If only, if only, the moon speaks no reply, reflecting the sun and all that's gone by. Be strong, my weary wolf, turn around boldly. Fly high, my baby bird, my angel, my only. And that is the end of Holes. I hope you guys enjoyed it. So in case you didn't catch it, they named the the product that Stanley's dad made sploosh. So I think Zero and, uh, sorry, Zero and Stanley made that together. So everything worked out in the end. Zero finally got a life, got a family. This is a really great book. I really suggest that if 
I'll bet you it's in your classroom library and in your school library. You should go get a copy. You should read it for yourself and you should watch it on YouTube or Disney Plus. I've had a fun time reading to you guys. See you later.